lift your hands for just a bit and just praise him for that blood. Come on, can you praise him? Church, it still washes away sin tonight. It hasn't lost its power. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for the precious blood of Jesus. While oh, precious is thy flow. So for mercy Lord thank you for that blood that still saves us from sin oh God hallelujah every drop of your precious blood oh Lord for the sins of this world for the sins of my life for the sins of this church oh God help us Lord to never forget the power of the blood the power of the blood the power of the blood mm -mm 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 -mm. If that song doesn't light your fire, you better get down and get saved again and get full of the Holy Ghost is all I got to say. If you want to stand back up for the reading of the word, Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. I believe I have a message for someone in this building tonight. Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. The title of this sermon is Improper priorities improper priorities improper means offending against accepted standards of decency it also improper means not conforming to what is conventionally thought suitable <laughs> improper means not right or unlawful priorities means the quality of being first in importance is the right are privilege of precedence against others. Improper priorities. Genesis 13, beginning with verse number 1, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very, Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. You may be sitting. Aren't you glad for the word of God, God tonight? I want to tell you a little story about Van Gogh. More than anything, Vince Van Gogh wanted to be an evangelist, believe it or not. He was only 25 a century, uh, he, he was only 25 a century ago, and he wanted to devote himself to his fellow man and the Word of God. It was this passion that brought young Vince Van Gogh in the spring of 1879 to the coal fields of southern Belgium. It was there in a little mining town that Vince outlined the rest of his life on the back of an old, faded, and wrinkled envelope. Perhaps it was the young minister's total selfishness that he first captured the respect of the crusty old miners in the tiny Borinage community. In a mine disaster, Scores of villagers were injured, and no one fought harder to save them than Vince Van Gogh. Day and night, he nursed the wounded, fed the hungry, clothed the poor. To give, there were times that he would even scrape 
the, 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 the slag for heaps to give his small church a fuel to warm the congregation at night. After the rubble was cleared and the dead were buried and the sick were made well, the townspeople turned to the Dutchman and adopted him as their spiritual leader. Every Sunday... Vince Van Gogh, they overflowed his services to hear this young, unassuming man preach passionately about the literal Word of God. He would dress in an old soldier's coat and trousers that were made of sacking. He took his meager salary and gave it to the needy and continued to preach the Word of God. Then... <laughs> came a disagreement with a church official. Must have been an Assemblies of God church. <laughs> then came a dis disagreement with a church official, and young Vince was dismissed from the pastorate of that small church. He was devastated. The career that meant everything to him and had been reduced to nothing in just a matter of minutes. There were long weeks of despair that followed Vince Van Gogh. He seemingly could not shake the depression of the event that had shaken his entire being. He lost, he lost his allegiance to his God. He lost his devotion to the Word of God and soon was drifting out just through life. One afternoon, Vince noticed an old miner who was bending beneath the enormous weight of a full sack of coal. In that instant, the fire flamed in Vince, although it would prove to be ruining to his old desire to be an evangelist. In that instant, Vince recognized the desperation and the burdens of these people and understood that it would be shared by his own soul. Fumbling through his pockets, the Dutchman pulled out an old, tattered envelope and then a pencil. He began to work, not on a sermon seed, nor on an outline of a sermon, nor did he jot, nor did he jot down any scripture. He just, the weary figure, he just began to sketch the weary figures on the paper that was crude at best. But he labored over and over until he finally completed the project. Beginning that day, Vince was to capture for the world the torment, the triumph, and the dignity of the people that he lived with. There was now a new passion, though an improper passion. There was a newfound job, sadly, but then, sadly, a lost ministry. The monumental ministry was never born because the preacher became an artist. You know him as Vincent Van Gogh, a man of improper attitudes and priorities. I want to speak to you tonight. That's what I'm preaching about. Improper priorities. John Knox shook Scotland with his prayers. But he was a man who knew his priorities. Jonathan Edwards became the father of the great awakening because he knew what his purpose was in life. Charles Finney brought revival during the Civil War because he was focused on what his priority was in life. John Wesley preached to the miners in the Virginian coal mines with great success because of commitment to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Could it be that Van Gogh might have been the key to revival in Holland, but he began and found an improper, improper priority of all things because of hurt in church? We will never know because he stumbled into a hidden talent that was much less significant than reaching men for the cause of Jesus Christ. A distraction that hindered his purpose 
of what God had called him to do. The Bible, this most brilliant book that man has access to often uses methods of comparison to illustrate a spiritual principle in your life. One of the ways that this is accomplished is to take two characters in a similar setting and similar time reference and show the ways of God. You look at it. The story of Cain and Abel. The story of Moses and Aaron. The story of Samuel and Saul. The story of David and Solomon. The story of Abraham and Lot. A long look at the life of Abraham and Lot gives men an understanding of the importance. Listen to me. In the story of Abraham and Lot, it, you understand the importance of pitching tents or building altars. There have always been men who walked with God. And there have always been men who have walked with men. You see, David walked with God, but Joab walked with David. Paul walked with God, but Demas walked with Paul. Abraham walked with God, but Lot walked with Abraham. In these crucial days, church, listen to me, please. In these crucial days that we're living in, you must be aware of your own spiritual condition. We must understand that this relationship, we must, this relationship is a personal relationship with God himself. You must check and you must maintain, and church, we must maintain the spiritual conditions of our lives and keep our priorities on this Christian journey with God at the forefront of your life. You must all, we must all keep our salvation a matter of personal priority in this world today. You will not, listen to me, church, you will not be able to blame the church. You will not be able to blame the pastor. You will not be able to blame the choir. You will not be able to blame the worship. It will be because you lost your personal salvation with God. You will not be able to blame the pastor or the board or even your family or your husband or your wife. Your job and someone else, we need to understand your spiritual condition, it is the most, needs to be the most priority in your own life. But sometimes improper priorities affect us in our daily walk with God. When you read the story of Abraham, he was the builder of altars. What is the significance of your personal altar? <laughs> Listen to me now. The altars in our lives are not to be haphazard. They are to be carefully constructed to God. The altars are not built merely in places of crisis. It's not something or stress, but the altar is to be a daily place that we go to to allow God to shape us to reach this world. Many times people wait too late to run to an altar and pray. They find themselves, their home, their life, their marriage, their situation is a job, fall into distress and pain. Then they run to the altar and say, God, help me, help me, help me. But honey, this must be a daily altar you build with God in your own personal relationship with him. <laughs> the altar, listen to me, the altar was the first thing that met the priest on his way into the holy of holies in the old tabernacle. You read it for yourself. The altar was the centerpiece of the temple that Solomon constructed. 
The altar is not only a place of sacrifice, but it is also a place of judgment. The altar is a place of worship and devotion, but it is also a place of blessing. You see, there are five great altars that Abraham had built. They reigned throughout all of his years, which tells me, honey, every day I wake up in the morning, I need to build a fresh altar unto God. <laughs> you see, the, it was the altar was the first thing that met the priest on their way into the Holy of Holies. The altar is the centerpiece. The altar is not only a place of sacrifice, it's a place of judgment. <laughs> the altar is a place of worship and devotion. There are five great altars in the life of Abraham. They range throughout all of his years. But you listen to me. There is one altar. There is one altar that he went to just once. But it was enough for God to see what kind of man that Abraham was. It's found in Genesis 12, verses 5 through 7. It's the altar he built at Shechem. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that had gotten in, in, in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and to the land of Canaan they came. And he, Abram passed through the land unto a place called Shechem, and the plain of Murrah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. You see, Shechem, listen, was the first altar of Abraham. He built his altar soon after his calling of God to leave Ur of the Chaldees. Honey, when God begins to call and you surrender to him, you'll build an altar for him. First altars are always important to men. They carry the memory of those first moments that God began to stir the heart of a gently, gently voice His will for our own lives. I began to reflect just a little bit today when I began to think back in 1978, I wasn't even nowhere near someone going to church. But I remember, I'm sorry, 74 that I found myself going to a little Pentecostal church, New Covenant, Assembly of God Church. A cousin had invited me. And there I experienced the life-changing power of God at an altar of prayer. And see, I remember, I say, oh, God, help me to go back to that day that I first found you and began this journey with you. This meaning of the name Shechem, listen to me. Is, 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 sh is shoulder biblically. When we begin to study the significance and the type of shoulder, we understand that the shoulder is meant for bearing burdens. Isaiah 10, 27 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing of God. Abraham learned first that his altar was to be a place that he left his burdens. What burdens do you have tonight? What burdens are weighing you down? Is it a burden of sin tonight? Is it a burden of guilt? Is it a burden of failure that you deal with? Is it a burden of bitterness? What is your burden tonight? Whatever your burden may be, the best place to leave it is at an altar of prayer. You see, Bethel's two altars are found in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse, verses 7 and 8 says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Verse 8 says, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he builded another altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. 
In Genesis chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, it says, And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the very beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Honey, sometimes we just need to revisit that first altar of repentance and prayer. Oh, God, thank you for what you've done in my life. I thank you for salvation. Anybody happy you're saved tonight? Honey, if you're not happy and excited about being saved, you've been saved too long. And you need to revisit that altar of that first experience with God. You need to understand this is serious business in our relationships with God. You see, I'm telling you, Abraham, he, you must have, you must have. Abraham would build two altars at Bethel during his lifetime. The first one he built was an extended covenant of to Abraham. He came the second time to Bethel after a failure in the land of Egypt. You listen to me. Pharaoh had, Pharaoh was about the, he, after Bethel, after lying to Pharaoh about the identity of Sarah. He came to Bethel blessed with cattle, with silver and gold. But regardless of a man's social position or how much you have or how much you own or how long you serve God, you must have and build a new altar. The name Bethel means house of God. The house of God is the altar that Abraham came to the most. Our greatest altars are in the house of God. The altars are in the house of God are those of repentance, of those of consecration, of those of blessing, of those of spiritual direction in life. That's how important the altars are in your life. Now look at this. You begin to go, you go to Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18. Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which, in the, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. He built an altar every place he journeyed. After Abraham had separated himself from Lot and his herdsmen, Abraham built another altar. There are times when our lives become cluttered with the lots who rob us of our spiritual blessings and directions. When the time of separation finally does come, when all of the distractions have been discarded, we need to build an altar. You must understand, church, we must be aware of those things that the enemy puts into our lives to distract us from our altar with God. Once that Abraham, once that Abraham had gotten rid of Lot, now the full will of God was about to begin in the life of Abraham. You read it. Did that mean that all of his troubles would disappear? Not at all. Not in any form or stretch of the imagination. But Abraham was moving toward the place that God said he would use him. By the way, the meaning of the name Hebron is league or confederacy or alliance. Once of all, well, listen to me. Once all the clutter, the clutter gets out of our lives, God will be able to establish the partnership in our life that he intended to have in the first place. But there are those, <laughs> there are those who trudge through life, hauling lots, <laughs> coaxing the lots of the world, pushing the lots of the world, persuading the lots of the world, urging the lots of of the world, badgering the lots of the world, trying to get some type of grasp on God. You see, an altar at Hebron is waiting for those of us who are willing to rid themselves of the lots that they think are so important in your life. You need to re-examine and look down really deep into the spiritual resources of your life and look 
for those lots that's trying to keep control of your spiritual life and build an altar to God. Listen, you begin to think about an altar he built in Moriah. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2 says this, And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I would tell you of. You see, it was to Abraham's final altar. It was to be the altar that shaped him for the rest of his life. It was an altar that he shrank back from and did not understand. It was an altar that he had to climb a mountain to reach. It was an altar that he would, it would crush the heart of Sarah and pierce the heart of Isaac. Listen to me, church. There will be altars that we build in our lives that will, take, will have the same magnitude in our own spiritual life. It will hurt to make the trek sometimes to an altar you must build. You see, Mount Moriah demands all of our commitment. Mount Moriah is the place where God can call preachers. Moriah is the place where he can call missionaries. Moriah is a place where he can call pastors and pastors' wives. You see, he can call today. Moriah is a place of total commitment to God. Moriah is a place of total dedication to God's will for your life. Moriah is a place of total surrender to God's will in your own personal life. Moriah is a place of sweet triumph if you'll let it be. Moriah is a sacred place that only you and God can experience. What in the world are you holding back or holding on to from getting to your altar? You see, Abraham built altars. Lot pitched tents. In looking at the composite lives of Abraham and Lot, it becomes very easy to isolate the difference in a man who's willing to invest in altars rather than build tents. Listen to me, church. You need to invest in love rather than hate. You need to invest in peace rather than war. You need to invest in faithfulness to God rather than unfaithfulness to God. You need to invest in joy in serving the Lord than sadness it is in this world. You must invest in unity and not division. You must invest in building someone up instead of tearing someone down. You need to invest in gladness in serving God more than sadness in when you got to go to church. You need to invest in the fullness that God has for you rather than dryness in worship your, to God. You must invest in your worship to God than just being a spectator when you come to church. You must invest in reading this word instead of of your own opinion or the opinion of someone sitting beside you tonight. You must invest in the mercies of God more than bitterness that you hold on to the rest of your life. You must invest in the service to God and then just being an attender when you come to church. You must invest in prayer to God more than you do invest yourself in gossip to one another. You must in be invest in giving to God more than just take, take, and take. Honey, you must invest in your altar more than just pitching tents. You listen to me. Abraham built his altars. Lot pitched his tent. Abraham had his own altars. Lot borrowed Abraham's altars. Not one single reference do you find in the Word where Lot built an altar. Abraham walked by faith. Lot walked by sight. His eyes lingered too long on the well-watered plains of Jordan. You see, he, his eyes wandered too long. Abraham was gener generous and, and selfless. Lot was worldly and greedy. 
Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. Lot found a city built by men but destroyed by God. Abraham became an heir of the world through righteousness. Lot lost, Lot, Lot's last mention in Genesis finds him in a deserted cave with all of his possessions. Honey, invest in spiritual things. Invest in God. We would even be left to wonder. We would, I'm even left to wonder about the salvation of Lot, except that Peter mentions him in the final time in one of his epistles. It says in 2 Peter 2, 6 through 8, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those but that he, after he should live, that those that live ungodly, and delivered just Lot. That's what it said. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Listen to me, church. We may live and dwell in this world, but the world doesn't have to live and dwell within you. <laughs> you see, there's contrast in altars and tents. Lot was concerned about his tents more than his altar. Lot gravitated towards Sodom because there were no altars in his life. There are some deficiencies in tents that are not found in altars. <laughs> Listen to me. Tents have to be pitched, thus meaning that they're but temporary dwellings. Altars have to be built for they are permanent places in your life. You must understand, tents have to be supported by ropes and poles that have to help hold them up. Altars are there to support you. A tent will never hold you up, but an altar sure will hold you up. Tents are made with inferior materials such as debris, cloth, and tarps, and they will have to be patched up time and time again. But an altar is forever because if the commitment of the builder is true, it will never, never, never have to be patched up. That's why, honey, when you build an altar, build it to last in your life. A tent is where man lives, but an altar is where God lives. <laughs> a tent was the place of Noah's sin and of Sarah's laugh of doubt. But it was at an altar where the fire of God fell at an altar for Elijah. There is no comparison between tents and altars. Yet even now, some people are trying their best to hold up their tents because they have improper priority. You see, tents really haven't changed much over the years. Men still try to pitch the same tents that Lot pitched. You see, understand, there are those in this room here who've been borrowing the altars of their parents, altars of their pastor, altars of maybe a youth pastor, altar of past experiences in this church. You built an altar a long time ago, but you haven't rebuilt it. But it's been a miserable existence. Why don't you give up and make sure the priorities are there and rebuild your altar that you must have with God? There are some who have been eyeing the well waters of Jordan, and finally you've gotten a tent up. It is a tent of a bright future, a tent of a career, a tent that needs a, bright, a career. But listen to me. When you, when you do that, it must, it must, it must needs to include God Almighty. Right now, you may think in your own mind, even in the sanctuary tonight, you may think in your own life that I can exclude God. I don't need Him. But you're fooling your own self. Your tent is going to fall. Your career has to have an altar. Your home has to have an altar. Your life has to have an altar. There are some who are looking toward the world for everything they can get. You're building a tent 
with relationships, with fame and fortune. Some have found a tent of illicit relationships, wrong relationships. And right now everything seems to be just fine. But sin, when it is finished, still brings forth death. There are some here who are so cold spiritually all because you have forsaken your past altars that you built. Conf con conviction is calling this very minute not only to ours but all of our souls. It's time to find some old landmarks in our lives and rebuild another landmark in our spiritual walk with God. Listen to me. It happened in Europe several years ago. A massive collision and derailment of two separate trains. Torn, lifeless bodies were everywhere. It was a grim scene that greeted the rescue workers on that cold morning. It was evident from the start that there would be very few survivors, if any at all. The rescuers worked on tirelessly with the bent steel and soft flesh, trying to save as many as possible. As they worked on during the day, it seemed as if one frozen picture captured the entire feeling of that mishap, of that wreck. A young mother's lifeless body had shielded her small three-year-old daughter. Somehow, the young child's body had missed death because the mother had wrapped her own body around her very tightly, around her only child. As the rescuers worked, they pulled the small girl from the arms of her dead mother. Amazingly, the small child did not cry or even whimper upon the separation from her mother. They took this tiny child to the hospital for x-rays and found that there were only a few minor scrapes and bruises. The little girl endured all the tests of examinations from all the physicians without any agitation showing. You see, there's something about that. Listen, it was then that the doctors began to notice that this tiny, bald little girl, this tiny, bald up was then, began, this child was apparently holding on to something so tight. Perhaps it was something that could assist them in identifying who she was. They began to attempt to coax the little girl into opening her little hand, but at no avail, she was clasping a hold of it. You see, finally, after understanding that the child was not going to open her hand, they pried the little fingers away from an object. The child immediately began to scream and cry. She had not cried when the rescuers took her from the train or from her dead mother's arms. But now, nor had she cried in the back of the ambulance. But now, she had not even cried during the battery of all the tests was going on. But then, when she lost her little small piece of penny candy, her life was shattered. You see, some people have improper priorities. There are some here who've allowed something in your life. A small little piece of candy to get you, to get between you and Calvary. Some have even taken out the same tattered envelope that Vince started with and began to get a little sketch. Your tent has proved to be bigger than your altar. There are some old landmarks, honey, calling you back to a place of fresh commitment to God. An old landmark of salvation. If you're not as excited about serving God tonight than you were when you got saved, you need to get re-saved. An old landmark of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Honey, if you haven't spoken in tongues late, you need to get refilled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. An old landmark of joy in serving God. Honey, it's not a, a happiness for me to go to church. I love going to church to worship God because that's where I found Jesus was at church, honey. You need to get excited about reaching out to people and service to God. You need to renew the old landmark about faithfulness to God. You need to renew that, that landmark of prayer. Oh, God, have mercy on my soul. Forgive me of sins, Lord. Renew my life. Renew my dedication. Renew my, I want to serve you, oh, God. You need a prayer life. 
You need to understand we need to rebuild the altar of witnessing. And honey, the greatest witness you can give, you don't have to go around carrying a 10-pound Bible telling people they're going to hell. You walk to Walmart. You go to the mall. You go to work showing Jesus Christ in your life. That's the greatest witness you can give anybody. You need to understand, rebuild the things that the enemies tried to, to try to steal from you. Read the, go back to the old landmark of reading this word. <laughs> Honey, listen, if you've not read the word today, get home tonight and read it. Read it. It's the only way. I'm telling you, I have fallen more in love with this Bible in the last few years than I ever have before because I understand, honey, this is what's going to get us through in these last days. It's not ABC, CBS, NBC, or Fox News, honey, or what's going on in the world. Only Jesus is going to be. You need to return back to the old landmark of where God did something for you in your life. I remember just a few years ago, Pastor Johnson and I had was going to the hospital, and I saw a sight that I have never, never, never forgotten in my life. As we were driving down Longtown Hill, and we turned to where the old Sherman's grocery store used to be, we saw a little girl. Some of you might know who this story, I've told this story before. This little girl pushing a baby carriage. We thought, man, she must have had the baby. I, we knew she was pregnant. She must have had the baby. So we pulled off the road and stopped, honked the horn at her, got out, went to her with that baby carriage. Going to see the baby. And as we looked into the baby carriage, pulled back the blanket. There was nothing in the carriage. And we were just, and she was talking to that carriage like that baby was in the carriage. She was carrying on like that baby was right there. And there was nothing in the carriage. She just smiled at us and began to push the baby carriage away. Let me tell you something, church. In this world that we're living in, some of us, they're just pushing empty baby carriage. <laughs> we go to church on Sunday morning and just go through the routine of, I've got to lift my hands during this song. I don't like that song, so I'm not lifting my hands on that one. <laughs> we go to the same old, same old routine time and time again. We go, we, we just kind of go through the routine of just going to church. We never come to an altar to pray. We never worship the Lord. We ne because why? <laughs> You've lost the priority. You've got improper priorities in your life. You have to understand, church, we're living in crucial days. We're living in a crucial time. And we must understand people are watching everything you do. Not just what the preacher does. It's watching what you do. If you're not very committed to the church, they're not going to want to come to if you're not very much in love with God, they don't want to love the God you serve. If you're always unhappy about that, they're never going to serve the God that you have. Because why? It's improper priorities have taken over in your life. Oh, God, as we began to get in that truck and walked away, I just began to think, Lord, please, please never let me get to that place where I'm just pushing an empty baby carriage. I want to keep you in my life. Every morning when I get up, I want to take you through the day. Because, honey, I know. You see, I know where I came from. I know how God, how miraculous God did something. And I know where I came from. I didn't have a chance in the world. But Jesus saw sit. Jesus saw passion and grace enough to try to get a hold of my life and make a difference. I'm telling you, I need to keep Jesus in my own carriage. So you've got to pretend that you're the carriage that's going around. Honey, are you just walking empty without the grace of God? Are you walking lifeless without the Spirit of God? Does anybody know the God that you serve when they see you? Not in, it's easy to do it in here. But honey, we've got to do it out there. What's the improper priorities 
that you have. You need to make sure Jesus is the main priority in your life. Stand with me, please, all across this building tonight. Can you just play and sing this song, Jesus? I know we sing it quite a be the Lord of all. Because that's my prayer tonight. Jesus, be the Lord of all the kingdoms of my heart. Just be the kingdoms of my heart. Hallelujah. Can you just lift your hands right now, church, and make this your prayer tonight, that Jesus remains. I know you've served God for years and years and years. Some have served God longer than anybody in this room has. But I'm here to tell you, you need a fresh commitment to the Lord. Lord Jesus, I want to make a fresh commitment to you. I want you to be the Lord and the priority that I have in my life. Oh, Jesus, Jesus be the Lord of all. Oh, Jesus, be the Lord of all. Jesus, be the Lord of all. Now, church, can we as a group, can we as a church just make the commitment to the Lord? Come and stand across this front, lift up your hands, and make the commitment to the Lord. Jesus be yeah. the Lord Lord Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of every Jesus kingdom of my heart, oh God. I give you my life. I give you my family, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus, everything I have is only because of your grace and mercy. Everything that we are is only because of your grace and mercy. Lord Jesus, never let me have improper priorities in my life. I might want a priority in Jesus. I want to serve you. Hallelujah. Can you just lift your hands and make that your proclamation tonight? I surrender all Jesus. The kingdom. commit our lives to you. Help us to commit our everyday life to you, Lord. Be the Lord and the King of all my heart. Oh, Jesus. The kingdoms of my heart. Sing that verse. In my heart. Jesus. Yes. There were kings. Jesus, I surrender all to you tonight. Oh, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I surrender my will, my plans, my life, my family, Lord. Everything to you, Jesus. I surrender all to you, Lord. I surrender it all to you, O Lord. church lord jesus i do pray that you be the lord of every kingdom in our own lives oh god we pray that you be the center of our life oh god the center of our will the center of our plans the center of our families oh god the center of this church lord we thank you 
We thank you, O oh Lord, for your wonderful, countless blessings that we receive every day. We're thankful for life, for health. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for this church, the people that's getting saved, the people that's receiving the baptism, the people that's being healed and delivered. We're thankful, oh God, for your wonderful presence that we feel every service that we come together in your name, Jesus. And I just ask your Holy Spirit to empower us, oh God, to power us, Lord, this rest of this week as we go to our workplaces and our places of business, our homes, Lord, that we will pray, God, help us to reach someone today. Help us to reach somebody. Help us to talk to somebody about the grace and blessings of God. Help us, Lord. Lead us. Lead us, Lord Jesus. Be the Lord of every kingdom of our life, oh God. Every kingdom of our life, oh God. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said, Amen. Hug somebody. Tell